I'll ask them when they join. Hey, everybody, Choi wanted to see your faces. I've never demanded that of you, but if you don't <laughs> mind. And then was there an internet problem? Uh, yeah, so this is most of them, by the way. Okay. And I'm going to give tell you a little bit about Choi. So she's actually um, one of the co-PIs on the grant. We, we had talked about the, the urban agriculture on Tuesday, hopefully, uh, and that was entirely new, as I mentioned. And so we have this we have this grant, and uh, we're trying to push initiatives at our campus because we haven't had too many grants, so maybe just one previously from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So Choi and I and a couple of other people got together, and we're building this urban food garden, and have research and and um, teaching and coursework. And we invite you to visit it in the fall or spring, whenever we're fully accessible at campus, but Choi has agreed to come and um, give us a presentation related to her research and research interests. So Choi, I'll, 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 I'll give you a little bit of biographical in information. So she is a professor and um, she's the chair of the, of the Department of History at our campus. It's a really very strong department academically and in terms of student, it, involvement and participation and, and, and research. And so it's a very dynamic uh, department, very active. Um, Choi's been very active herself in research, particularly in publishing books and monographs. She's the author of two monographs and many peer-reviewed uh, articles. She's the co-author of two textbooks and has co-edited four volumes of essays, which I guess is a standard publication mode in history. Uh, she has a new um, document, a new text or um, volume called A Transnational Approach, which will be published by Bloomsbury Academic Press in 2021. So I think uh, you know that is forthcoming in the near future. Um, Choi got here, I think, a year or two after I did. So she, you know, I'm obviously, it's, Cal State from a parent has been much harder on me than on Choi. But um, anyway, you know, I got to know her probably um, just a few years ago. I knew her of her reputation and, and knew of her from her scholar, scholarly works. But started to get to know her a little bit better maybe six, seven years ago. So in 2014, she was a recipient of the California State University Los Angeles Outstanding Professor Award. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an award that is um, prestigious at our campus. She serves on the advisory committee of the Wend, Day, Wend Museum. I hope I got that correct. Of choice at Wend or Wenday or some other pronunciation. Mm -hmm. The, is, it the when, when, is it Wend Museum? Venda, Venda. Wenda, Venda, okay. And I should have should have looked that up. But uh, and she's a uh, also on the editorial board of the journal Slavic Review. And her research, she does a lot other than uh, agriculture, um, regenerative agriculture, history of agriculture, which I think is a bit of a newer interest. She's been very involved in historical research in uh, Russia. And so uh, she's on the editorial board of, of the journal Slavic Review. By the way, I'm about 50% Slavic. I think I mentioned to you, Choi. So um, she serves on several committees of the American Historical Association and the Association of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. And we're so excited to have her here today. She's going to be talking about uh, um, Los Angeles agriculture, agriculture in the city, Los Angeles. So uh, it's all yours, Choi. I'm very happy to have you. Okay. Well, thank you, Barry, for that super kind, uh, undeserved introduction. And, and Dr. Hibbs was also a winner of the Outstanding Professor Award the same year I got it. So you guys should know that. And thank you for those who've turned on their phones. Um, it's so nice to see some of your faces. And finally, I'm definitely here under false pretenses. I have a PhD in Russian history. That's my training. 
And as Barry says, this is an interest that I've developed the last few years. And so um, it's very exciting, the new research, but I'm definitely not an expert in the field, but I feel that I've read enough of other people's research that I can present an overview of can the city be reimagined? So that's the question I'm posing to you, that we tend to think of the city as a parasitic place, right? It brings in resources from the hinterland, from the countryside, from around the world. We consume, we produce trash, right? Um, but what if the city was reimagined as a place of production, production of food? How would that change the city? How would that change individuals? How would it change population health? And most importantly, how could then the city become sustainable? Uh, because right now, in terms of emissions, we keep thinking about transportation, but agriculture and urban spaces, as you well know, contributes way more. And so reimagining the city, reimagining our food systems, we might wind up killing two birds with one stone. At least that's my hope. And, and I'll tell you how we get to this. Um, because we are in a, wait, let me, let me go to slideshow, yeah. Because, uh, start, because we're in a strange city, right? Most cities have long urban histories. We are in a city which has a long agricultural history. And if you think of that in US history, there aren't that many cities that can claim this agricultural heritage. And so what I'm going to talk is about is how the past can inform the present, okay? And please stop me if you have questions um, and interrupt me because I'd much rather have a conversation than just a, a monologue. So I started a little uh, early in time and Barry, your class ends at six, right? So. Yes, Choi, uh, you, you, you know, so five, 550, 555, yes. We actually have lab after the class. So if you do happen to go over a little bit, not a worry, you know, you got plenty of time or you can stick to the, you know, what we thought about 50 minutes. Okay. So, so then maybe I won't show you the YouTube video. If you have time at the end, we can come back and look at it. This is something- well, we, have, we have time. We have time because um, lab will be short tonight. So please, if it's something you think it's, it will be useful, let's, let's look at it. Uh, well, we could come back. This is a colleague of mine, Steve Hackle at UC Riverside, who's been working on the labor and how the indigenous peoples of this area was enslaved by the mission system. And I, um, but, but we can come back and look at it. It might make more sense to look at it at the end. So, okay, sure. Fine. So the indigenous peoples who lived here prior to Spanish colonization, the Gabrielino or the Tongva, um, we tend to separate people between those who practice settled agriculture versus people who we now call the foragers. Ten years ago, I would call them nomads. I'm not supposed to use that word anymore. Um, but my question is that even foragers practiced some form of agriculture. It might not be the way that we think of agriculture as monoculture, right? That's what we've been taught. You are either a rice farmer or you're a corn farmer or you're a barley farmer. But they did practice agriculture in the sense they knew how to grow a dizzying variety of foods by certain agricultural practices that actually we can learn from. So I'm just going to, and this is, I was uh, writing up this slide and I was thinking I could have listed maybe 200 things that they were growing and that's only the stuff we know. God knows what else they were growing. So if you just take a look at it, some of these, you know, the seeds of various grasses, chia and buckwheat, just these two alone um, can grow with almost no water as opposed to rice and wheat, which needs massive amounts of water to grow. So just imagine of what the net result would be if we start changing our diets and incorporating what is now called dry farmed grains instead of the wet farm grain. So I just want to bring some things up. Apart from that, they had a huge repertoire of medicinal plants, the sages, the California poppies, and I can go into this at length. They also uh, were what we call opportunistic feeders. 
So they figured out many, 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 many nuts that grow locally over here from the pine nuts, of course. Some of you might know the acorn, which they knew how to leach out the tannins and turn into a flower. Many other kinds of nuts are very nutritious. We've been taught to eat walnuts and pistachios, which are very water heavy, but there are many other nuts and seeds which are very high protein, which is again a matter of changing the way of what we consider as good food. There are lots of local berries that grow here. We like blueberries and strawberries, very water heavy crops, uh, but if we learn to love the California blackberry, manzanita, laminate berry, toyon, um, the list goes on. Um, the strawberry fields that grow in Ventura, have, we have no business growing uh, strawberries over there. Um, those could be replaced by a variety of local berries. The other things that they learned to eat, which was the powerhouses, of course, has any of you eaten uh, Nopal or Opantia? Anybody in this class who's ever eaten Nopal? Um, well, if you learn to eat Nopal, this is something that will grow without any water. It has more calcium than milk. Um, it has more minerals than any mineral supplements um, because it pulls out minerals from the soil, you know, potassium, magnesium, all the necessary minerals. Um, Nopal alone, I sometimes think, will save the world if we only learn to embrace a local cuisine. And finally, they had figured out how to um, eat the roots of the yucca and the stems. It tastes like asparagus, agave, a varieties of lilies, um, a wild onion, alliums, which are very important pro, uh, prebiotic foods for our gut health. And finally, they'd figured out fire management, which we haven't figured out. They knew how to set small scale fires, um, which encourage these plants to grow better and also create clearings where the animals could come. Some were caught and eaten, some were helped in pollination. So they figured out fire management. So I'm inclined to say that these people practice agriculture, even though we don't think that they practice agriculture. So I'm starting with them because I think we have to go towards their direction rather than doing what we've been doing for a long time. Oh, Joy, a real quick question. Yes. Uh, that's a variety of uh, different types of uh, plants and uh, fruit and such uh, native. Um, would you say that, uh, and of course, I, I'm sure they vary significantly as to their, you know, although generally fairly drought tolerant, but would you say that those grew, most of them kind of closer to the ocean where it's a little moister or did they grow where there's a little more topography or did they grow better? in kind of our drier, hotter inland areas like San Gabriel Valley? Are there any kinds of generalities as to their, how so, prolific they were? So manzanita will grow above 2000 feet, right? So manzanita simply won't grow at lower elevations. Um, of course, for the acorns and the, and the pines, and we have, you know, the oaks that have adapted very well, right? Um, we have such a huge variety of inland oaks. Um, the black, the toyon, uh, the lemonade berry, the California holly needs no water as the cactus, yucca, agave, um, the wild onion likes a little bit of water. They will basically grow with, you know, two, three inches of rain a year, they're fine. Um, so, and they supplemented their food with game and fish and a variety of birds, right? Um, so it's a different kind to think a way of thinking about food, but what we know is our health is dependent on a diversity of foods, right? So the monoculture system that we have has also narrowed our food choices significantly. Okay, so um, so then of course, and, and not everything was perfect in the system. Uh, we know that there were terrible droughts. Uh, we know that the Indians died, the indigenous people died, and that might be one of the reasons that they agreed to enter the mission system. Um, there's a lot of controversy. A lot of scholars say, you know, there was genocide, there was enslavement, and there was some of that, but it also seems that many Indians willingly entered the system because the missions were so incredibly productive. 
they produce such masses, massive quantities of corn and wheat and barley that the, in, the indigenous people had never seen granaries of food, right? When you're an opportunistic eater, you eat what's available if you don't have uh, surpluses, which is of course the whole concept that the Europeans brought to the Southwest. Um, and they were able to do this. Um, the Spanish were not uh, particularly advanced, you know, compared to the English or the British, but they brought water systems that the Moors, the Arabs had brought to Spain. And some of these, the Roman aqueducts. So they learned how to bring water down from the mountains. If you go to the Santa Barbara mission, you will still see the aqueduct that was built. They brought cattle here. There were no sheep and horses and cows, right, on, in the new world. And the cattle with their feet and their legs converted the prairie, this open prairie where thousands of varieties of plants bloomed into compacted farmland, right? So the cattle actually changed soil composition. And this is what we now think is Mediterranean agriculture, right? Um, from the wheat, corn and barley, vineyards and olive plantations, lentil peas and chickpeas, and all the, all the fruits, which are originally from China, which then naturalize in the Mediterranean region, right? And so now what you have then is an incredibly um, productive system, but it is also a system that all agricultural systems are based on is, a, is coerced labor, right? There isn't an agricultural system in the world that pays its workers, including the American ones, living wages, right? And so monoculture and surplus has always been tied with coerced labors and, and labor. And we, and we know, you know, how much we rely for our food on um, undocumented workers. And it never has, I've never quite understood why we can't pay a little more um, to hire our local people, but that, that, that's, an, that's another, another question. Okay, any questions? So you see the two systems that I described. One is uh, people coexisting and eking out enough and the Indian population is only 200,000. Now what California, we have 40 million people or something crazy like that. And so it's not possible for us to all be foragers. Um, the land could not sustain it. So we need a little bit of this, but I would argue we need a little bit of that as well. Okay, um, I'm not going to go through all the history of farming in the interest of time. I just wanted to point out uh, that uh, Los Angeles until about the Second World War was primarily an agricultural farm, uh, a powerhouse. We rarely think about it. We tend to think of LA as highways and a super modern city with a, a river that runs in, in a concrete bed like Dr. Hibbs told us in his lecture. But um, Los Angeles has very deep agricultural roots. Um, after the mission period ended, the Mexican grandees set up these giant ranches with you know, 100,000 head of cattle. Um, when that period ended, when California was incorporated into the United States, um, we saw all these other things in California. You know, citrus and grape, we are still one of the biggest producers of citrus and grape. The Chinese immigrants, um, again, coarse labor brought a whole bunch of brand new vegetables with, uh, to enrich the Western diet. And more recently, um, California has become the capital of berry production, avocados, walnuts, pistachios, rice, cotton, and I didn't add this, alfalfa, which is incredibly uh, heavy on water, which we export to China. Now, why we are growing alfalfa to feed Chinese cattle in a state where historically doesn't have a lot of water. Um, this goes back to the water wars of the late 19th and the early 20th century where certain farmlands got certain rights, um, but climate change is changing all that. Um, we are seeing it in real time that these unsustainable practices um, will, e even if the government massively subsidize it as as agriculture is subsidized in the United States will simply not be sustainable in the 21st century, which is why I am um, very interested in these other models of agriculture.
And finally, we are uh, um, flower farming. Like, anyone been to the flower market in downtown Los Angeles on Third Street? Uh, go there one day early in the morning at five o'clock. Uh, it's really something to see. It's one of the biggest flower markets in the world. Unfortunately, all the flowers are brought in from places like Nicaragua and Colombia, where they're grown in hothouses with lots and lots of chemicals. But once upon a time, the flower market was all locally grown. And there's a lot of interest in revitalizing local flower farming, but of course, sustainable flowers, not, not the roses and the calla lilies. Okay, so I'll go to my, and this is where I really want you guys to pay attention because this is the heart of my talk. And then please interrupt me um, because uh, this is something that I can't even tell you how passion, how important it is to me and something that I've been working on for a very long time. Um, has anybody heard the term regenerative agriculture? Have you hey, read hey, it? Folks, you can unmute and other than chat and comment and please do. Choi really appreciates that. So um, don't, don't hesitate to unmute. But I, I have personally learned that term from, from you, Choi. I've got probably from its context figured out what it meant, but I've learned a little bit more about it uh, having, you know, been involved uh, in this grant with you. Any, anyone, anyone else? Like to take a guess at what this term means, regenerative agriculture? Anyone? Um, it's agriculture that um, is meant to be sustainable and help build back the nutrients in the soil as opposed to just take, take, and take the nutrients out of the soil in a sustainable way, as opposed to just adding like liquid fertilizers. Okay, so you are so smart. You're absolutely right, right? So um, in the 1960s, and again, this wasn't an evil plot, right? That the US capitalists dreamt up. The world was facing this unsustainable crisis of overpopulation because we've never had this kind of population growth, right? And suddenly there were literally billions of people to feed and the traditional methods weren't working. And what was called the Green Revolution in the United States um, about selective genetic breeding of plants to increase yields, that was one part of it. The other part of it was using chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides. And you know, it's, it was amazing. Suddenly, um, US crop yields were the envy of the world. The entire world was saying, what are they doing? I, I mean, the uh, Soviet premier Khrushchev, when he comes to uh, America to the, and he sees the cornfields of Iowa and he goes back and he's like, what are they doing? Why can't we do that? Why can't we have those eels, right? So uh, the criticism has developed only in the last 20 years. So this was a system that uh, really fed the world, but like all good things that came with a cost um, because soil, which is the basis of civilization, actually, if you think about it, when there's no soil, there's no civilization. Um, industrial agriculture tends to think of soil as a canvas, right? Uh, not as a learning management system, but something, you know, you pour in water, you pour in chemicals, you put in these genetically modified crops and you get incredible results, rinse and repeat, right? You keep doing it over and over again. And then in the 1990s, uh, the crop yield started uh, you know, tapering off, we weren't seeing these miraculous. So, you know, people came up with more genetic modification rather than just selective breeding with land races. They started, you know, um, the GMO crops, which was another level. What they realized with the GMO crops was that in turn, they became resistant to pesticides and uh, they became Franken crops. But the other thing that happened which people started paying attention to in the late 1990s and the work of this uh, Ohio uh, soil scientist, uh, where he said that we are losing our soil. We are losing our soil in the United States. We have lost maybe one third of our topsoil in the nation's breadbasket. How long can we keep afford to doing this? Because what regular agriculture does is if you guys have been to the Midwest, you grow corn all summer, you harvest the Corn. all winter, the fields are left unprotected. So the topsoil washes away with the rain and the snow and the sleet. 
And what is worse is all the chemicals that are pumped into that soil washes into the creeks and the rivers, which feeds into the Mississippi, which goes into the Gulf of Mexico, right? Um, so this was become, this, it, it was very apparent that this was a huge problem, but you know, why mess with success? The farms were still producing. So it's been really interesting for me. I've been part of this conversation in a small way and it's taken on urgency that 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been even been invited to give this lecture uh, because uh, no one had a clue about what certain fringe people were talking about, except they weren't fringe, they were absolutely right. So regenerative agriculture starts with how do we build soil? If anybody has a compost pile at home, right? They know that the main job of a gardener is to build good soil. If you have good soil, you can grow anything or well, not anything. You can grow a lot. Um, and But how to change the mindset of a hundred billion dollar ag industry, right, which is heavily subsidized by taxpayers, which is mechanized, which has been taught that crop yield is more important than anything else. So what if we start changing the carrots, right? So what if we pay the farmer to regenerate the soil as opposed to pay the farmer to grow alfalfa for China? You see what I'm saying? So this agrarian farming actually goes back to national politics, right? And if we as consumers start eating local California blackberries instead of strawberries, think of how much area can be rededicated to environmental protection, right? I'm so, I'm not, uh, if you want to change, uh, save the planet and changing the way you eat uh, might be the best way to best way to start, right? And the other thing about regenerative agriculture, so it's not just about soil health. Um, today, there was an article published in Nature because I don't know if you all know, there are the Green New Deal people who believe that we should give a trillion dollars to all the big corporations who are suddenly pretending to be super green. And then there are the other people who say, you know what, let's change agriculture. Let's protect our wetlands. Let's bring back the mangrove forests. Let's, let's rear forests, right? Let's build forests. And this is a much simpler way to sequester carbon than to dim the sun like Bill Gates is wanting to do. And I'm sorry, maybe this is just my particular kind of politics, but there's very hard evidence to show that geoengineering is very scary, but there are many, many, many simpler ways um, to put back the carbon, bury it deep in the ground. And when you bury carbon in the ground, of course, you have a rich microbial diversity, microbes that eat the carbon, keep it in the soil, you replenish the soil, you will have wonderful crop growth. Maybe not the same things, maybe different things. So to me, this is the simplest, most virtuous cycle. And the other wonderful thing about urban agriculture is, is that if the city starts producing not all its food, even 10% of its food, right? Um, we can cut back on our urban emissions. All the trash that goes to landfills, you guys are geologists, I don't, don't need to tell you, produces methane, which is 25 times worse than carbon dioxide. If that trash is kept out of the landfill, turned into compost, applied to agrarian agriculture, then this is the new circular economy that many economists have been talking about for the last 20, 25 years. You know, instead of the linear economy, you produce, you consume, it's trash, right? And you never think about it. So urban agriculture could be part of that, um, of that circular economy. So I'll just give you a few examples because um, when you say urban agriculture, what would it look like, right? What would the city look like? So the number one I'm going to bring up, some of you might have heard of it is of course the South Central Farm, which was in the nineties, this was an abandoned uh, city lot um, that the local inhabitants took over and turned into a thriving, beautiful farm only to have it torn down. And now that lot is again sitting abandoned. And so cities can do a lot instead of just prioritizing developers of high rises in downtown like Mayor Garcetti has done, the city could have diverted a lot of money to encouraging um, on all its many abandoned lands um, farms. So that's number one. 
The number two, and, and think of all these initiatives came from below. That's what I love, right? Um, is Ron Finley, the most famous gangster gardener, as he calls himself. He dug up the median outside his house uh, and started planting food. And, and the city came after him. He fought back and then they changed the ordinances. So now by law, you can dig up the median outside the house like my husband and I have done and you can plant. Um, think of the entire city where if we had edible landscape instead of dead grass um, that we have. So that's number two. And number three, this is something that's just uh, starting. It's, it started in New York maybe 15 years ago, New York, Detroit, Chicago. I don't know why we are so late to it, considering we can grow food 12 months of the year, is micro farms, right? So dig up your front lawn and start planting food. Um, there are commercial possibilities in this, and this is also part of the circular economy. If you can't do that, container gardening. Um, you don't need to import lettuce from the Imperial Valley, right? You can grow a variety of, um, this is what we are going to show in our garden, that how many greens, perennial greens you can grow with very little inputs, um, how many farm laborers' backs will be spared, and how little plastic you will use when you at least grow your own greens, which I think is the easiest to grow. Um, the other things, you know, I have a lot of things over here is of course, urban agroforestry building an urban canopy, edible landscaping, just adding and think of our homeless population, you know, incredible homeless. I mean, think how their lives would have been if there was edible landscaping in the, in the city. Um, we can't forget the native plants and the pollinators, right? Because 80% of our food is pollinated by birds and bees and insects. They have to eat as well. And, you know, um, they eat, of course, from imported plants, but they really prefer the native plants. I see it in my garden. All this can help with carbon sequestration. Um, the city emissions, you know, so I've seen some calculations, we can reduce it 20, 30, 40% is something that urban planners and architects are seriously thinking about, but obviously we're not seeing it in LA soon enough. The other thing is rain harvesting. Think of every time um, you plant, what trees do is trap water in the soil, which then goes down and feeds the aquifers, right? So um, you, the best way to rain harvest is of course to, um, is to plant. And finally, all of this can mitigate radiant heat, right? Heat that is radiated back from concrete, from the asphalt, um, from, uh, we live in this concrete jungle, right? How, how do you mitigate that? Um, concrete removal is incredibly expensive. And, you know, Barry gave us a terrific lecture on this. But if we plant, and if we plant uh, trees and plants that can work with our particular microclimates, we can go a long way in, in offsetting urban radiant heat. And, you know, I mean, these, the heat island is becoming a real issue in places like Phoenix. They're really planning ahead and, you know, especially around bus stands, they are planting trees because the poorest people take the buses and they are the ones that are exposed to the 121 degrees, right? So um, this in the next, this might be perhaps the most important thing that we do mitigating radiant heat in the next. Uh, Joy, if I could ask a question, yes. can you hear me? Yes, of course. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware that you had actually, you and your husband had taken as uh, one of the medians and had uh, developed a urban garden there. I thought it was on your own property, but I guess you have both. But what is the water supply that you're using in the median and what do others use? And I, I suppose you're using the more of those drought tolerant and native type plants um, that have low water, lower water use, but what, what are the water supplies that people are using are they using the regular municipal water or are they, you know, because because it's not it's not as easy to use gray water or storm water capture. So what, what are you what are you folks doing in your median for waters? So we've actually hooked it up to our water system. So we pay to water the median garden. But Barry, you won't believe how low our water bills are because of the plants we've planted and in the last uh, 16 years, the soil is completely transformed. And so what happens is as the uh, 
soil retains more and more moisture, you need to water less and less. I mean, that's the thing with regenerative agriculture, right? Um, if your soil is good, you will need to water maybe once a week. If your soil is bad, you'll water every day. It, it's truly a virtuous cycle. And what are you raising in the median? What crops are you raising? Or oh my God, we have uh, fruit trees, we have medicinal herbs, we have pollinator plants, we have a whole bunch of greens. Um, so many of our neighbors come and ha we have berries. Um, it's an incredible amount of food that's growing on the median and, and sometimes well, that, that in addition brings people together and sort of builds rebuilds that spirit of cooperation and, and neighborly you know um, relationships uh, today so many people don't even know their neighbors so that certainly would have many many additional peripheral benefits beyond the nutrition and food products that's being provided so I really, think so. Really I, need, uh, I love it when I go out, I see all the kids there. So it started with the little ones, now it's the teenagers, then it's older people. We've made so many friends through the median uh, garden. Do you have any teachers in the neighborhood who bring students there and discuss what's happening and trying to expose kids at a students at a young age to to what you're doing and trying to change the, the mindset so, in so this kind of regenerative agriculture mode and perspective very you know what my husband and i once a month we open up our garden um for uh, other people who want to come and yeah. then you know we show what we are doing our composting i serve some food it's just free we've been it's going to be our 10th tour. We started during COVID. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's been interesting. You know, on our, on our film, on our own garden, we should mention that we see this garden maybe providing perspective where yours is a model, where what is learned and, and the knowledge and information, uh, where we want all students exposed to it. And so, and then kind of take a few seconds or you know 30 seconds at your system at your median and talk talk a little bit about that and see see that as a model or neighborhood uh, kind of ron finley's the real model we were very super inspired by him well i mean you're i'm saying for our own film <laughs> you're <laughs> part of part of the pro project so i think we should add a little footage on that as well but that's really neat but, but you know, Barry, this morning I saw um, a California butterfly that's almost extinct. A ah, on, in your area? Yeah, because we have so many uh, native plants and I, the California skipper, which is so rare. I was mm. transfixed at six in the morning. I was just standing there watching this butterfly saying, oh, so you're not extinct, you're still alive. Um, oh, that's good. That's all, you know, that's great. They need to see it really proliferate. Yeah, uh, much more, but yeah, a few models and reaching people and I have some questions later, but uh, let's let's continue unless anyone else has comments or questions students. Okay, so I'll just go to my my last slide. I'll just tell you all a little bit about the garden and you know, this is where I'm so grateful to Dr. Hibbs because um, we people in the humanities are filled with good intentions, but we don't have a lot of money. And so when Dr. Hibbs asked me to be a part of this grant, I was so excited because I had done a, uh, planted a little garden on campus. They'd given me very little place for this other grant, but now we have a big space, right? And so I just want to tell you um, what are the different things that we are doing. And truly, we're not spending that much money, Barry, right? When you think about... Uh, how it doesn't cost that much to build a garden. So the first thing we did was we, you know, we built the fruit trees. And, and here, I don't want people to get so hung up on native uh, versus imported, right? Because I just feel like if you look at the history of nature, things are moving. Birds, animals, they bring seeds, plants move on, climate changes, some plants adapt, some uh, plants die off. That is also part of the natural cycle. So I'm a little alarmed by how now people 
I have friends, you know, who will only plant natives and I, I don't, I'm an imported product myself. I've adapted to this local environment. I don't, and, and native circa what, right? Um, when the Europeans came in the 1700s, um, we don't know what was growing, say, in the 1200, right? And so I, I think climate adapted is a better um, way to go, but I always like to have some native mix. Um, so, uh, you know, none of these fruit trees are local except guavas are from um, Central America. And guavas is what, you know, this is more vitamin C than an orange. And guavas will grow with less than one tenth of the input of citrus, which now has all these diseases because of aggressive monoculture. So what if we start eating guavas instead of orange? Uh, oranges in the morning. You know, a small thing like that can trigger a big change. Pomegranates, jujube, this uh, Chinese, uh, like a chi it's a little apple, very high in nutrients, will do fine with two inches of water. It's one of those amazing trees. Fig, moringa. So fruit trees should be the center of any garden, right? Because they're so easy. Once you plant them, you feed them, they keep feeding you for the next 20, 30 years. Um, I have my perennial and edible plant list, right? Because perennial is part of regenerative agriculture. So we've been taught by nurseries, plant this in the spring, dig it up in the fall, throw it away, plant something in August, plant something in December, because the whole thing is focused on buying, right? But when we think of perennial, then what we are doing is we are using the root system of the plant um, to regenerate the soil because I, I, I really believe in perennial uh, plants. I have a whole bunch of things. So longevity spinach, this is from um, all over Asia, but bladder pod um, grows like a weed on our hillside. It's a little bit, bit bitter, um, but the, I love the taste. Um, you can eat them instead of peas. Um, the native uh, pollinators love it. Um, I just feel we need one talented chef to start doing something with native plants that adapt well. Amaranth is not local here, but it's local all over um, Central America and South America, all over Asia. Amaranth just gives, you know, you eat the seeds, you eat the leaves, you eat the flowers, it'll come back, nasturtiums, the elderberry, um, which is a powerhouse, lemonade berry. I could go on, as you can see, I'm, I'm super passionate about plants. The so other things that we'll be growing are medicinal plants, right? Because it's not just food, food is medicine uh, or it should be, right? And here I have, we have a mix, um, um, arba buena, which is a mint, right? Oregano, sweet wormwood, imported, imported, lemon verbena, imported, but sage. Uh, we anchor it with sages. Sages are local to California, right? So if, I found mixing and matching works really, really well. We have planted some nopal um, on the hillside, um, which is, as I said, something we should learn to eat. We will be planting some yucca and we'll be planting sweet potatoes, not native to California, but native to Latin America, right? Um, you eat the greens all summer and you eat the potatoes all winter. What's not to like about sweet potatoes? And then this is something that I'm really beginning to learn. I don't know a lot about is edible grass seeds, right? And so I'm experimenting with something called California buckwheat, um, which grows wild and which I'm going to plant in the garden um, because this might be the new frontier of learning how to eat different kinds of seeds and grains as opposed to our wheat and rice, right? Already we've learned how to eat barley, but there are so many other edible grass seeds that we can add to our repertoire, which can be grown very sustainably um, in a city because, you know, wheat and rice just are monoculture crops. Okay, so I'm, I, how am I doing on time, Barry? I'm good on time? Sorry about that. Uh, I was muted. Uh, we're right on time, Choi. Uh, it's perfect. And uh, we still uh, we have time for some questions and discussion. So just um, certainly I, I um, am looking forward myself to learning about many of these different uh, food, food items and 
you know, what conditions they grow under, what seasons. Um, and so it's very exciting. I really, you know, <laughs> we've talked about garden, but I've been thinking about it in a very narrow perspective. So now for me, that was very um, formative and amazing. How, how much, I mean, we have the room for, for all of that. Uh, and, and how much does Sasha, does she, she's going to have a much more narrow range of vegetation, I think, isn't she? Or so what, what is she going to grow, Sasha, on those raised beds? I think Sasha's doing the three sisters, the squash, the beans, and the corn. I think she's okay. doing that, but she yeah. wanted some input on winter crops. And so I'm hoping she let me grow some different kinds of grasses, which grow well here in winter and die back in the spring. So maybe we can come to some agreement. And, and I don't want to take time away from any possible student questions, but I have so many myself, but maybe I could ask one more. Uh, are those natives, uh, I mean, what would be preferable? Because, you know, raised beds, it's kind of, mm -hmm. I understand the logic, you replace soils that are of fairly poor quality, but with mm -hmm. the right amendments, and then just through this process of uh, development over the years, mm -hmm. the, the soil um, characteristics, nutrients, texture, organic matter all improves naturally if it's done right. So what was better um, for growing most many of those raised beds or in the actual ground or it, it just depends on how you manage them because it seems like in the ground is more natural so you know, what, what... we have the grasses growing on the hillside already right and the other thing yeah. I mean the easiest thing would be to do chickpeas because we know they were farmed here in the mission system they naturally add nitrogen to the soil, right? So you do a variety of peas and beans and lentils, which is what people used to do throughout the world uh, in the winter. We could do some California clover. So the possible, I mean, that's the funnest part about a gar garden, right? The possibilities are just endless if you pay attention to the soil rather than only worrying about the, about but so so would they do better if you dug say the size of the of the container in a raised bed if you just dug up soil and mm -hmm. blended it with amendments and put it in you know back in the actual at grade land would mm -hmm. that be better do you think than in these raised beds because you know they were wanting so many raised beds so I was like well, that isn't as natural. It's a kind of an artificial system. So do you understand my question? Well, I mean, if you... Raised beds are very good, you know, if you're trying to do the, uh, I don't know how corn will do in the raised bed, but squash will do fine, tomatoes, all the perennial greens that I'm talking about is much easier than you water very little in a raised bed. Um, yeah. And it's easier to maintain the soil, but the California natives will go in um, in the ground and I want to plant them around the fruit trees because you see uh, you attract the pollinators so you're increasing your fruit production by planting plants that will get the bees and the butterflies and the moths so interesting it might be interesting to do some comparisons in raised beds and then in very significantly amended because the soils are poor at the site in, in the ground, but with significant amendments that make the soil characteristics similar to what it is in the raised beds and just see, you, you know, if the sun amount is the same, the water amount. Monica, by the way, is involved. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what your schools are doing with urban gardens? I'm not sure the other students are aware, if you don't mind sharing that. Every school has a garden, you said, in your district. Could you say a few words about that? Yeah, so about five years ago, there was the money given by the district to each school to like have their garden. And initially, they all kind of had a space, but um, this was more of like a centralized type of project where like every school would have one. And so they actually gave money to the school so they can hire somebody to take care of it. And then, you know, then each school grew like their own things. And um, that became highly political. <laughs> And it, that went away. But um, what we ended up doing instead is uh, we what we're doing now 
is basically we created a committee of teachers that um, are working on units of study, uh, K-12 um, at different grade, grade levels. Um, and so what they're doing is they're, they're creating these units of study to bring academics to the garden or bring the garden into the academics. So using the environmental principles and concepts which were, um, uh, were adopted in the math curriculum and the science curriculum and most recently in the art curriculum. So they're all kind of embedded. And so these uh, units of study are basically around you know, the garden. So like one team is working on um, bringing pollinators to their, their elementary school. So, you know, the kids do these lessons and, and it's basically like a community service project where they, they actually have to come up with uh, a problem and then potential solutions, talk about like the criteria constraints and then, and then, um, uh, you know, try to convince like administration that they need to do this, this project. And then they, they go ahead and do it and then they, they implement it and monitor it. And then um, uh, part of what we haven't been able to do. So right now there, you know, the gardens are not being tended to. So that's one of the things that after COVID, when they go back, they have to figure out, you know, what to do with the gardens. We need to figure out who is going to um, like take care of the garden. But the, the main point is that everybody at the school, like every grade level, like K-5, K would have like one day where they go out and do academics with the garden. So they go and learn about plants or they observe bees or, you know, count ladybugs or whatever it is that their lesson is about. So we have, we have eight lessons or eight units that we're working on. Um, and so when Barry told me about this project, you know, uh, the kids haven't seen anything outside of their school. So bringing them to a garden that's actually working where they're doing research and things like that, um, that would be beneficial, not just to the kids, but to the teachers so they can keep bringing more students. And that's uh, another grant we're having discussions about um, uh, submitting in a few months having an involving k-12 but then also doing some of the work on heat island and water conservation some of the things we talked about in, in class the the other day and so yeah we see great potential by the way um if we have a gardener i'll be looking for you know not a long a lot of time but uh around when is it when megan it will be graduating january uh, January, February, you know, a, a part-time gardener, a few hours a week. Um, so, you know, if you have, if you, if you don't have gardening skills and what, that might be a good job for you while you're a student. Um, you know, that'll be, it's my turn to have someone from geosciences. So make sure you have some gardening skills, but um, yeah. I, I, and, 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 Listen, Choi, I don't want to hold you up, um, but we still, we have labs, so if there are any other questions, we certainly uh, would uh, more than be more than happy, I think, unless, Choi, your time is a constraint, is it, or are you, yeah. where are you on your schedule? I'm, I'm free for the next 15 minutes, if there are any questions, okay. I'll answer. Yeah, any other comments, questions from students? Yeah, I have a one or two more, but I'm going to let students... Uh, add any questions or comments or any of their own personal experiences with um, activities related to what Choi has been talking about, um, if there are any, please. I have a question. Um, I don't yeah. know if you'll be able to answer this or not, but um, is there any like legal reasoning that cities don't plant more like fruit trees uh, in city parks or is it like the extent of maintaining them? You know, um, I've been on campus for 27 years and for years and years I've begged about edible landscaping on just our campus and I was always told well we don't want the homeless coming on our campus and harvesting the fruit uh, which I thought was the strangest response ever um, but you know I, I realized the city bureaucracy is so slow that 30 years ago you know someone said plant these trees it was ginkgo biloba so they planted all the ginkgo now somebody smart is 
said plant oak trees in Pasadena where I live. And that's why they've started planting oak trees. So city just takes forever. But I think if we all get involved, I think when it's nobody's responsibility, you see, I, I think we need an engaged citizenry, right? If we want an edible city, landscape city, we'll get it, right? It's just a matter of rethinking a little differently. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's so, so kind of the bug has been, you know, the bug has been in the ear now, of people, and the, at least there's a consciousness now. And there are many people, universities, we're rather slow, um, but thank, thankful to Choi because she's been pushing for this. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of campuses getting established in urban agriculture and they have urban gardens and and what we heard from Monica, you know, so there are steps and probably beyond baby steps at this time, but it is, you know, there's bureaucracy and, and money. And <clears throat> so, you know, it's a work in progress, but um, <clears throat> as we learned today and, and also Tuesday, I hope in, in what I had to say, you know, we need to supplement our diets with nutritious food and, and, you know, it's a heavily corn and wheat dependent diet. And, and, and so, you know, this is all going to be beneficial, particularly in the inner city. And so, yeah, so making a little progress, you know, maybe in 100 years or 50, it will be a much larger and, you know, we will, things, the steps that we're taking now will be looked on as, you know, kind of the reformate reforms that led to something much bigger and better. I mean, that's, that's what we hope. Marshall, you had a follow up question? Um, no follow-up question. Um, I guess curious, do you, are you engaged at all with like the Pasadena um, City Council or anything like that um, regarding like edible landscapes or like fruit trees or anything? There's only 24 hours in the day, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, my husband and I both work very hard and we thought if we can do something at home and feed some of our neighbors, that would be a start. Um, it's yeah, I, I wish I had the bandwidth. When I retire, I will definitely get involved. But we're seeing that just in our neighborhood that you know more and more people are, are planting stuff on the median. So it, it does have a ripple effect, or I want to believe. Yeah, Jonathan, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Um, so in terms of urban farming and planting on medians, do you think in the future there would be a need for like um, regulation because I'm sure not everyone is gonna do organic methods like composting. Uh, people are gonna use th synthetic fertilizers and all that, which mm -hmm. is bad for runoff and stormwater in, in California and right. LA. Yeah, and I, I'm sure, you know, I mean, this micro farms that I'm seeing, which is a brand new thing in LA, um, once it becomes commercially successful, it will hire a lot of people and it will have to be regulated because you're absolutely right. Um, we are doing it very ethically. If, if we were doing it to make money, then of course we would be pouring the chemicals on, right? I mean, I have the privilege right. and luxury of doing it for fun. If I needed money, I would certainly be not doing it as ethically. You're absolutely right. I mean, mm -hmm. and that would be a huge regulatory nightmare. But San Francisco has this incredible system of turning their com organic waste into compost. It is now the program is paying for itself and all the uh, farms around San Francisco, they can't even keep up with the, with the demand. So mm -hmm. cities can turn their waste into gold, right? So, I mean, um, they can actually make money from this. And once people realize they, they'll be rewarded for doing this, then the incentives now we have for commercial agriculture will go away. So to tweak the system, you have to change the rewards of the system, right? And San Diego now, I think, gives you a tax break if you uh, take over abandoned city lot and farm it, right? So mm. I... I don't know why LA has the most expertise in agriculture given our population and we are the most backward. <laughs> I, I never understood why, um, because we like skyscrapers downtown. That has been our number one priority under Garcetti. I'm sorry, I don't mean to say horrible things about Garcetti. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, it's you know been uh, wonderful to have you join us t today, Choi. Very, very great, good information, and and I uh, uh, what you had to say, I think, um, really is the appropriate topic of you know for for what we're trying to emphasize this last week. Uh, I've told the students it's a it's new material in watershed analysis, but uh, been a, a long semester with a lot of material, but I think we end it this week with, you know, hopefully on a high note of something new material. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, continuing in, in, a, in our smaller, small effort, but um, let's hope, you know, it's, it's a catalyst with these students for what they do and how they live their lives and, and what they find to be rewarding and stimulating and, and uh, they're more cognizant of some of the issues. And so it's been a, a real pleasure to, to have you here joining us today. Thank um, you guys. Thank you, Barry. And have a wonderful lab and the rest of the summer and start planting, start with a pot, start with something, okay? <laughs> Have a okay, good Joy. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to stop recording.